so I'm going to fess up. When Danny and Bernie asked me to have a conversation with Leah I, about racial justice, I, I balked because I wasn't sure that the old white Jewish lady should be the one <laughs> taking the seat. And they assured me that Leah wanted the two of us to have this conversation. And then, of course, I was in, because you guys might be able to say no to the force of nature that is Leah Penniman, but I sure can't. And so we have, we have 22 minutes to address centuries of injustice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to do the absolute best we can. And when you and I talked about this beforehand, there were really three areas, and I want to make sure we, we, we cover them. The first one is land ownership. And you know, I think people are, are, are in tune with some of the worst of, of the history of blacks in this country. But some of the less charismatic injustices, like access to credit, make a lot of difference too. Talk about land ownership and what the problems are and what we can do about it. Well, thank you. Um, I'm a farmer. I'm here for the farmers. And one of the biggest challenges. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges that we face is access to land. Um, and this is because centuries of land theft, first of the indigenous people, First Nations people of this land, um, through a process of attempted genocide. But that wasn't the, the only theft. It was simply the first theft. When black folks, despite the broken promise of 40 acres and a mule, were able to acquire through their own dollars, 16 million acres of land, almost all of that was taken away. It was a major threat to the sharecropping system in the South. So the white caps, the Ku Klux Klan, the white citizens council literally burned down homes and lynched people to drive them off the land. Mm -hmm. The Great Migration was a refugee crisis, mm -hmm. right? And then the USDA kicked in with the discrimination in their lending programs. Now we have air property issues where if you, you know, die without a will and an unscrupulous developer can get one of your great grandchildren to sell their share, it forces sale of all the land. So we're at the point now where literally 98% of the arable land in this country is owned by white people. That is the highest concentration of land ownership in, the, in one racial group that we've ever seen in this country. And it's a, it's a national crisis that's not getting talked about. How are we fixing it? <laughs> Look, all right. Reparations. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get right to the point. <laughs> and, and what does that look like? How do we make it work and how is it ag specific? All right, so there's a lot of things when we talk about solutions. I mean, one, I'm not being facetious. I really do think we need a massive land reform project. I think it needs to be led by the indigenous people of this land. Um, you know, let's talk about the fact that the doctrine of discovery in 1455, when the Catholic Church said literally white Christians can go forth, vanquish, colonize, and enslave non-Christian, non-white nations. That's the foundation of property law in this country. The Supreme Court upheld it in 1823, and most recently in 2005. How very empowering. Yes, yeah, so we haven't actually fixed the fundamental nature that property law is based on theft. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do want to follow the lead of indigenous communities. I think that we need to create a system of land trusts in this country that are able to take um, arable land that's at risk of development, hold it, and make sure that it goes to the most disadvantaged farmers. So there's a priority is set aside for black farmers, mm -hmm. a set aside for Latinx, Latino farmers um, who want to shift from the wage labor trap into being able to be managers and proprietors of their own property. And so I do think we need a, a federal intervention on land. OK, no two words will make an audience's eyes glaze over faster than farm bill. But, <laughs> but when it comes right down to it, this sounds like reparations. It sounds like this big, hairy thing. But let's talk about the $16 billion that went just to trade assistance for farmers in this year and, I, and, and last year. Do you have any sense of how much money we're talking about here and whether it's possible to repurpose it within you know, this, this, legisl this regulatory for format that we already have? Or do we just have to raise it and start again? That's a great question. So I know reparations is a scary word, so I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, <laughs> this comes from one of my elders, Ed Whitfield. He said, you know, imagine if your neighbor stole your cow. Everyone saw him do it. Two weeks later, they come over, tears in their eyes, remorseful. I'm so sorry I stole your cow. It was wrong. You know, I'm going to make it up to you, though. Um, every week for the rest of the cow's life, I'm going to give you half a pound of butter. <laughs> what would you say? Uh, no, I think I would they, like they, my they, cow back, right, actually. Right. So reparations is actually about not imagining that we start today mm -hmm. and ignoring the theft that happened. There mm -hmm. actually is a, a recourse that is needed. You know, um, Yes Magazine calculated we're somewhere between 4 and $7 trillion of wealth owed mm -hmm. to black Americans just looking at 
get unpaid wages. Okay. Um, and so we haven't even been able to pass HR 40 to study reparations, nonetheless allocate reparations. Right. So I do think we have a ways to go, and the Farm Bill is not going to be able to encompass it. And the pushback will be, of course, from people who have been farming land for the last you know, 40 years in Iowa saying, well, I didn't steal anything. I bought this land fair and square. Why should I be subsidizing this? And I'm sure you hear that all the time. Absolutely. What do you say? Well, here's the thing. We're on a legacy of white affirmative action. I know a lot of people think that affirmative action started in the 1970s with supposed differential admissions to universities. But it actually started in Virginia, way back in the 1500s, when an indentured servant who was white would get 50 acres of land, a bunch of cotton, mm -hmm. and some money to go mm -hmm. get started. And it has become part of US law. Look at the Homestead Act. That's basically millions of acres of indigenous land given at low or no cost to white settlers. If you look at the land-grant universities, the, the Naturalization Acts, there's so many laws throughout history, um, including under the USDA, that have disproportionately benefited white people. Mm -hmm. It's why today in this country, if you, if you wake up white today, you're 16 times wealthier on average at birth than a black person. And you can't tell me that that white baby did extra calisthenics in the womb to earn that wealth, right? <laughs> so there might be an individual farmer that, sure, they purchased it fair and square, and they imagine that their ancestors pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. But we're talking about a systemic level. 80% right. of wealth is inherited. The wealth gap is widening. And so at a societal level, we do have to address a transfer. And we, everybody has to step up to the idea that this is isn't about individual culpability. This is about history. This is about societal culpability. This is about racial culpability. Absolutely. And you know, there are two other aspects of this. One of it is labor. And you and I were both talking about it, because you and I both farm. <laughs> and you and I both know what it's like to lift heavy things all day, every day. Absolutely. What are the racial aspects of that? Absolutely. Yeah, farming does get romanticized. And it is really, <laughs> it really, really hard work. So I'll tell you another quick story. I have a friend of mine who wants to go unnamed, who works at an ag university in the Midwest. And he said to a classroom auditorium full of students who all want to be farmers, how much would you need to be paid to work at the meatpacking plant in town? Right? So I'll ask you all, who would work at a meatpacking plant for $15 an hour? Raise your hand. 20, 30, 50. Y'all got some trust funds. OK, $50 an hour is a lot of money. 100% of his students said there is no amount of money that you could pay me to work at the, at the meatpacking plant. And they're plant. the ones who know the meatpacking plant. Because it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You are very likely to lose a limb, get repetitive stress industries. You can't get the smell out of your clothes. And they added, besides, that's Mexican work, right? Which <laughs> nice. we can gasp at. But fundamentally, we're all complicit in a system where we create through climate chaos, through unfair trade agreements, situations abroad that are so onerous that indigenous people will leave land that they own and families that they love as much as we love our families to cross a hostile border into an unwelcome territory to do labor at wages that are below US minimum wage. And so we're talking about how in 1935, right, when we got the whole beautiful package of the, the New Deal mm -hmm. and we had eight hour work day and the right to a day off in seven and the right to bargain, farm workers were excluded from that. Domestic mm -hmm. workers were excluded from that because they were black. And I'm not being sensationalist. Mm -hmm. The Southern Democrats would not vote for it if it included black people. Mm -hmm. We've not updated most of those labor laws. The Fair Labor Standards Act still excludes farm workers, which means if you work at a small farm with less than seven employees, there's literally no federal minimum wage. None. And so how is it that we have not addressed that? Is it possible that the fact that we are now experiencing a shortage of farm labor, um, and I have heard anecdotal stories of organizations, industries, individual farms that are uh, improving standards, that are improving pay. Is this working in laborers' favor? It's actually not. So um, at the end of the Civil War, there was a labor shortage, right, because of right, the end right. of slavery. And so what the South did is they figured out how to create new laws called the Black Codes to criminalize blackness. So essentially, mm -hmm. loitering became illegal. Mm -hmm. That means standing around like y'all are doing, right? Vagrancy, not having a job, specifically a year-long contract on a farm. You'd be arrested for that, mm -hmm. put into prison, and then leased back to the plantation. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to your point. So 73% um, of Alabama's state budget was based on that. We are seeing in 2019 the highest level of convict leasing since the early 1900s. Because of the shortage wow. of immigrant labor, mm -hmm. right? They've got to find, it's not like the US is going to suddenly say, let's treat workers fairly. They're saying, who can we exploit next? Incarcerated black men are picking the food. So what do we do? We pass the Fairness for Farm Workers Act. We end penal farms. Right? We equalize all labor standards, and we find pathways for migrant workers to become land-owning farm, you know, farm managers is what we do.
I think we would be remiss if we didn't address the uh, feasibility of that in today's <laughs> political climate. Um, and so given the hostility in this administration to so many of the things that you're talking about, um, what are the odds that we're going to make this happen? Well, I don't think we should underestimate the power of the people. I mean, New York State just passed a farm worker labor law because of massive groundswell from the farm worker community. You look at the work of the Immokalee workers in Florida. Mm -hmm. They took on major fast food companies, got them mm -hmm. to pay a surcharge on their tomatoes, and then reallocated that to and farm Barry worker wages. And Barry wrote a great book about that. Yeah, and farm worker rights. And so I think that um, we can't essentially give up and imagine that we've lost just because, we, because the monster in front mm -hmm. of us is huge. I think more than anything, it's laid bare what we've always been up against. So now we know what we're with. Are any of the 2020 <clears throat> candidates talking about these issues in a meaningful way? Actually, for the first time, and I've been in this uh, industry for 23 years, and for the first time, it's actually part of the conversation. Reparations, we know, but right. the Warren campaign and the Sanders campaign have contacted us and our national networks to say, how can they take a stand for black yeah. farmers? So we're wow. <laughs> so the, we talked a little bit about ownership. We talked a little bit about labor. Um, but distribution of food is such a big one because it affects even people who don't want to farm and who don't work on farms. And let's face it, you know, those first two categories of people, they're extremely important, but they're small. But everybody eats. Mm. Let's talk about distribution of food and what are the racial aspects of that and what are we going to do about it? Oof. <laughs> I like how we're trying to solve the entire I know. food system. Well, we have 22 minutes. minutes. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> well, here's the thing, right? The USDA will call neighborhoods where I've lived food deserts, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that they're high poverty areas without grocery stores. Right. The problem with that term is it assumes that what we have in terms of that food disparity is natural. My mentor, Karen Washington, who's in the room, I think. I saw uh, <laughs> Taught me that this is actually food apartheid, right? It's a human created system of segregation, mm -hmm. relegating certain people to food opulence and food choice and others to food scarcity. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is that, you know, one in three black children are relying on the emergency food system just to get their caloric needs met. Mm -hmm. You know, in our communities, diabetes and heart disease are disproportionately impacting black and indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And again, not because we don't know how to eat or don't mm -hmm. want to eat well or don't have good culinary traditions. It's because if I have a few dollars in my pocket and I live in the capital district neighbor you know I can go to the corner store and get hot Cheetos but I cannot get anything that we're eating that we're snacking on here I can't get a burrito I can't get a salad and so I think that we really have to address the fact that it's been a legacy of housing discrimination you know redlining unfair zoning that's excluded uh, black people from from land ownership it's been the ghettoization mm -hmm. of the reservation and mm -hmm. commodity food dumping that's resulted in these health disparities so one of the things you talk about in the book is that um, uh, you know, we, if we look at, at what American blacks are eating, people always talk about the same things. Oh, it's, you know, it's fried food, and, and, and it's, it's, it's a diet that's not helpful. But if you dig back past that to the African roots of these diets, it's, it's a different story. It's, it's the grains and the legumes and the tubers that are the things that you grow and the things that you cook at home. Are people connecting with that ancestral diet? And does that help with a transition to a more healthful diet in these communities? Absolutely. We don't need any evangelism in our communities telling us what to eat. We need the support to be able to go back and eat the things that our great, great grandparents would prepare. Mm -hmm. um, there's some great work being done by Old Ways organizations, some work by Bryant Terry, to really reclaim our, our ancestral traditions and foods. We have a very greens-based diet, you know, a tuber-based mm -hmm. diet, plantains, legumes. You know, it's, it's our great 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 grandmothers who literally gathered up the seeds they'd saved their cowpea their black mm -hmm. rice their okra um their millet and braided it into their hair before being forced I remember you telling us transatlantic right. slave ships right mm -hmm. they they carried those seeds with them um, because they believed that we would exist and need to inherit that seed mm -hmm. and so what we're doing in our community is finding the ground to plant that seed and that's the work that needs to be supported not some sort of white savior thing in our communities and so i mean give it up <laughs> And so, you know, the thing that's clear, you know, reading about uh, about the the history of, of blacks and farming in the U.S., reading your book, reading other people as well, is that um, it, 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 racism comes from so many angles, and and now we have this this sort of systemic problem. And yeah, food deserts is a part of it, but it's pretty clear that 
it doesn't, you can't just take a supermarket and put it in a food desert and expect the problem to go away because it's much deeper than that. So I'm not black. I write about food. There are other people in this room who are deeply concerned about this who also aren't black. What can we do? Absolutely. So here's the thing. The solutions are already there. Um, some of the work that Mama Karen and National Black Food and Justice Alliance and Heal Food Alliance are doing is gathering up from our communities. What are the policies that need to change? Gathering up information for our communities about how folks can help. And we've put together a policy platform with over 100 action steps. And there's something for everyone, you know? So my, my daughter Nishima says the food system is everything. It takes sunshine to get onto your plate. So the good news is there's lots of points of intervention. So for some people, if you're controlling the purchasing at your institution, you can make sure to source mm -hmm. from black and brown farmers or from farmers who at least um, our certified fair trade through the mm -hmm. Agricultural Justice Project, right? If you have the ear of a congressperson, you can tell them that you think that we should um, increase funding for the EQUIP program so that there can be uh, funding There's for- a farm bill again. Farm bill, right? So there can be funding for ecosystem services that farmers are providing mm -hmm. and on and on and on. So there really are so many ways to help and important ways to leverage privilege. It's not just the problem of the people who are, who are impacted by that harm. How about academic institutions? Is there a role for them? Well, one thing I think about is just the, the ways that we tell stories. For example, I've heard regenerative agriculture thrown around, but I haven't heard the founder of regenerative agriculture credited yet in this space, who's Dr. George Washington Carver, who is a black farmer at Tuskegee University. And in the late 1800s, a generation and a half before Rodale was convincing farmers against great skepticism, right, to, to do cover cropping, to do um, crop rotation and composting and, and mulching, and actually started the first extension agency where they went out and did extreme regenerative farm makeovers on the most decrepit farms in the counties across the South and made them as made them into these um, you know beacons of hope mm -hmm. and training. And so reclaiming the narrative, you know, we have composting because of Cleopatra, we have raised beds because of the Ovambo people in Namibia, right? We have the CSA and pick your own because of Booker T. Watley. These are black farmers. Mm -hmm. And so really reclaiming the pride, the dignity, and the rightful credit of mm -hmm. these powerful sustainable technologies in the communities where they come from. Do you from. talk to academics about this? Yeah. Do we have academics in, <laughs> in, in the audience? Because how did we lose track of that? It's about power. Because if people who control the narrative um, are the people who can garner resources and control society. And I think um, people are afraid to give to share power with marginalized communities. It's part of, frankly, white supremacy. And on the one hand, it feels a little dispiriting to be having this conversation in this political climate. But on the other hand, it, it's nice that there is hope that there are people talking about this for almost there the first hope. time. And I have to say that, that, that you're helping because I don't, I, I, some of you have read her book. It, it is awesome because it is this combination of education, inspiration, history, uplift, and irrigation. It's got, <laughs> and you can actually learn how to start. There's one page with that had a quote from Harriet Tubman about choosing the thing that makes you come alive. And you can read about that, and then you can find out that you know it'll cost you $2,400 to do chicken housing. And, and it is this, this synthesis. And you know, we were talking about this um, right before we came out that, that I asked Leah, do you ever get tired? of having being black be the thing that identifies you. And tell, tell them what you told me. Yeah, so it's, it is interesting. While I'm obviously very, very passionate about talking about racial justice in the food system, I got into farming because I'm an earth nerd. I actually have I'm super socially awkward. I don't like people that much. Super socially I like, awkward, ladies I like and gentlemen. I soil. <laughs> and I like trees. And I talk to butterflies. And so, but you know, Rarely, if ever, has someone asked me to give a lecture on soil science, carbon sequestration, or how to select like the right cover crop mix for overwintering. So I'm still waiting. Um, there's, a, there's a great article called Black Faces, White Spaces about this sort of phenomenon where folks of color are asked to only talk about race. Uh, but I do hope we can move beyond that <laughs> because race becomes normalized. And there's a bunch of other speakers who are talking about it, too. And then mm -hmm. I can talk about butterflies and soil science. <laughs> And that's, that's, a, that's what a just society looks like. And like we have seconds left. But I, I mean, we both farm. And 
I have to, like, one of the things that actual food producers always talk about is how different food is when you grow it yourself. And it seems to me that some of the people who come to your farm, who participate in the programs, um, get that sense. And that changes the way people think about food. How important is that? It's so important. I will tell you, we've had thousands and thousands of youth and hundreds of adult aspiring farmers come through. And no one has ever been like, I don't like vegetables or I don't want to eat this stuff. Because we grow it. It's ours. We're connected to it. It's delicious. It's beautiful, right? And I, I am really heartened. So when I do want to quit, which is at least annually around this time of year. <laughs> you and me both. Um, I think about this returning generation of farmers. I mean, we have a waiting list multi years long of black and brown folks who want to come back to the land, who really believe while the land was the scene of the crime, she was never the criminal and in mm -hmm. fact was a source of our strength. And the earth is calling us home. And we really believe that to get free, we have to be able to feed ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, Leah Peniman. Thank you. Thank you. Around the applause, everyone.